guys, I'm Kate. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to episode one of Cooking with Classics. Today I'm going to be discussing a general review of the best-selling mystery novel of all time. And then there were none. And also what Agatha Christie taught me about writing while I was reading this book. And also how writing and genres have evolved over time since this novel was published way back in 1939. Be free. <laughs> all while baking a dessert inspired by the book. And this time I'm going to be baking a honey panna cotta, which I think will become clear why I chose honey panna cotta if you either know the book and or as this review progresses. And uh, if not, it's because I took a little bit of liberty <laughs> in deciding this dessert mostly just because I wanted to try it. I've never done it before, so this is either going to end in disaster or be wonderful or I guess somewhere in between, but let's hope it's more wonderful than disaster, okay? <laughs> Here is my ingredient lineup. Oh. And I will put the instructions and the recipe that I chose down below. I did take some liberties. This is why it's going to end in disaster is because I took some liberties with the recipe too. <sighs> First off, let me put some respect on Miss Christie's name because she is the, Oh my gosh. She is not only the queen of mystery, queen of mystery, but she's also the most widely published author of all time in any language outsold only by Shakespeare and the Bible. Agatha. Also her second husband was an archeologist and she would travel with him on his many adventures. And then she would set a story in the country that they were in. And I just, that is living the dream, I tell you. Also, before I get started cooking, I wanna give you a very quick comparable in case you haven't read And Then There Were None. And let me just say that if you like the movie Clue, if you're as big a fan of Clue as I do, you should absolutely read this novel. It is so good. So, okay, let's get bacon. Cooking. With classics, cooking with classics. What am I doing? Okay. <laughs> and then there were none starts off with a rhyme, which basically details the way that the characters are going to die. So it is very central to the plot. And I flipped back and forth so many times trying to figure out what was going to happen and comparing to this freaking poem. Ooh. So nothing can tell you more about the story than this right here. 10 little soldier boys went out to dine. One choked his little self and then there were nine. Nine little soldier boys sat up very late. One overslept himself and then there were eight. Eight little soldier boys traveling in Devon. One said he'd stay there and then there were seven. Seven little soldier boys chopping up sticks. One chopped himself in halves and then there were six. Six little soldier boys playing with a hive. A bumblebee stung one and then there were five. Five little soldier boys going in for law. One got in chancery and then there were four. Four little soldier boys going out to sea. A red herring swallowed one and then there were three. Three little soldier boys walking in the zoo. A big bear hugged one and then there were two. Two little soldier boys sitting in the sun. One got frizzled up and then there was one. One little soldier boy left all alone. He went and hanged himself and then there were none. Boom. Bring to boil, stir to dissolve sugar, cover pan, remove for heat, wait 10 minutes. Stirring. Waiting for it to boil. So this rhyme is central to the plot of the novel because it's the way in which all of the characters are going to die. <laughs> I love that so much. They're all gathered into this house by a semi-anonymous person called U.N. Owen, which they later piece together as being like unknown. They're all kind of tricked in different ways. Some people think they actually know who the person is. Some people don't. They just get different letters in the mail saying, come to this house on this island and let's have a chat. Something I do think is interesting is that that would like never work nowadays because we all have cell phones. I would be like, um, let me just Google this real quick. <laughs> so on the first night that they're all gathered in this house, a voiceover plays. All of their sins are announced. They're all in some way or another guilty of killing someone else. And now most of the people there do not attest to the sins. They're saying, that's not me. I didn't do it. They've got it all wrong. But there are a couple that are like, it's true for me. So if it's true for me, is it true for you? And now with this poem, they do realize kind of early on how it ties to the way that the deaths start happening. For them, of course, the question is, how legit is this? And as the reader, of course, we know this is what's gonna happen. But also the inevitable question, not just for the characters, but also the reader is who done it? Dun, dun, dun. This is taking so long to boil. Come on. The sugar though is completely dissolved now. <laughs> Yay. I'd 
like to interrupt this though with a real quick PSA of sorts that the original title was not and then there were none. It was something much more offensive and that when it got published in the US they changed the title to and then there were none. Again based off of the poem which was also offensive. I'll link this down below if you want to see the Wikipedia page and kind of learn more about the history. I didn't know this when I started reading, but there are a couple of things within the context of the novel that make you go, oh, wait a minute, where you can kind of tell that it was written in a different time and place. But I will get to that more in depth a little bit later on because it was something that actually taught me about writing and word choice. We'll put it that way for now. <laughs> Is it done boiling? All right, I turned off the heat, it's boiling, we're the cover and take it away. We'll go ahead and set the timer to 10 minutes. The craziest part to me though is how much she tells you up front in the story. Like this is going to happen. It's just the ways in which it's going to happen that leave the reader in the dark. And it's crazy because she mentions red herring in the poem. So you know something tricky is gonna happen. And yet, she just continually tricks you. I flipped back and forth so many times to try and figure out when the red herring was coming, how the red herring was going to be, and I'll be damned if I did not figure it out. I was wrong. I couldn't even figure out the who done it. I didn't figure it out until the end when she basically tells you, where the person acting as you and Owen confesses to their crimes. Urgh. I need to place one half cup cold water in a small bowl and then mix in the gelatin. I spilled a little, it's fun. I was trying to be dramatic and it didn't really work. All right, one half cup cold water and small bowl, sprinkle in gelatin mix, set aside to soften for five minutes. I can do that. But also let me just say that I appreciate not being able to figure it out. I kind of hate when I know who does it, like when there's a mystery in a story, but it doesn't even feel like a mystery if I can guess it early on. Like, I will say though that I like to feel a little bit smart and guess it at some point. And while I had my suspicions about a character, I was wrong. I was wrong in the way. Look, that's all I'm gonna say. This is actually a good mystery. <laughs> and if you've read the book, please comment down below and let me know if you guessed it. Am I just, then maybe I'm not as smart as I like to think I am. <laughs> Pack it. Does it have instructions? I don't know if I'm supposed to stir it or not. Hmm. Executive decision, I'm stirring. Five minutes, perfect, I have five minutes left on this. Let's move on with the review. Now something that's both writing and reading related that I found so interesting about this story was that she has so many different point of views. There are, you know, 10 people cause 10 people are gonna die. But she also has like, you know, I think four or five additional point of views that she kind of goes into the mind of. And as someone who's writing a story that's a horror comedy spoof with seven different point of view characters, I have been wanting advice or help on how to do this. And I think she does it really well. But <laughs> for the first four chapters, or actually I made a specific note, chapter seven, page 91. Let's see if I can find it. That was me being like, I'm finally able to tell who's narrating it without the names being there. It was really hard to read. I'd say the first like two or three chapters, there were so many characters she throws at you and so many names and I was just lost. It was intriguing enough that I continued on, but it made it so that the reading felt like an actual mental exercise instead of like a relaxing book, which is fine. And you know, again, I continued on and it was great. I'm so glad that I did, but just as a forewarning of sorts. But one of the things that I loved that she did in the way that she utilized the different point of views is that as the action is heating up and as the stakes are rising in individual chapters, it'll be moving and progressing and you're going and you're going and you're starting to like feel the rush of the story. And she she compounds on that by making the point of view shorter and shorter and shorter. And so the reader's kind of scrambling, the characters are scrambling. It is such a cool way of kind of mirroring where the plot's going. Ooh, I loved it. I have an example that I pulled. So things go from like full pages for individual point of views to having like a million different point of views on two pages. It's crazy and amazing. But speaking of those point of views, something that I've noticed over time, the way that genre and writing has kind of evolved is that we are not team third person omniscient point of view anymore. We don't like that. And actually, because I was doing pitch wars and I submitted for that, I've seen several places where people are like, don't do third person omniscient. I don't want it. I don't like reading it. 
And I don't think that that's strange. I think that's just a trend and the trajectory that we've gone over the course of time. The only genres that I really continue to see this in are like romance novels. Romance novels still tend to have this specifically between the two main love interests, but then even side characters, you'll kind of get into their head immediately. And I guess high fantasy, like Game of Thrones, you know, you alternate who's narrating the chapters, but I don't consider that to be quite the same thing, but it's close enough, you know? But we're, we're trending away from that. We're not into this third person omniscient anymore. And she will go from being like, this character said, to this character thought, to this character said, again. Vera thought, she said. Going back to the story, the first, ah, ah. What are my instructions? Set aside to soften for five minutes. Ooh, it is kind of jelly -y. and large bowl. Where are my large bowls at? Large bowl. And large bowl with yogurt, honey. Where my honey at? Oh. <laughs> yogurt, honey, salt until combined. This is a very exact science. One cup. This is about a half a cup and that's how much you need. So I'm just gonna pour all of it. Making a pattern in the bowl. So much honey. There we go. Oh, that sound. And then a very small teaspoon of salt. A little bit of salt. Feel like salt bag. Don't get salt But going back to the story, the first death absolutely killed me because the characters are so confused. I actually, let me see if I can find it. My note, maybe I shouldn't show this. My note is actually a bad word and then LOL because I thought it was, I thought their reactions were just so funny. Let's go back to red hair. Puppy, what'd you do? <laughs> Let's go back to red herrings for a second because even though we know how many people are going to die, you don't know the exact way that the poem is going to be revealed and we don't know exactly who is going to die and when. There are several times where you're certain that character X is going to die, like the scene is perfect, the timing is right, the kind of mood is right, and then she'll shift the point of view and then it's character Y that dies. So many times she kind of tricks you. Oh. <laughs> she tricks you early on and repeatedly so that when the actual red herring time comes, you don't even know what to make of it. My personal example for this is that the character at the end of chapter five, I thought they were for sure gonna die and it's someone else. All right, let's see. Return cream to boil, remove from heat and immediately stir in gelatin until dissolved. I can do that. Okay, return to heat, remove, immediately stir in gelatin. I'm gonna bring my gelatin over there and I'm bringing you with me. And now we just gotta wait for this to boil again. My favorite activity. Also a very specific reader thing that she did that I absolutely love when I'm reading a book is when it kind of references back to the reader and the line goes, it's only in books people carry revolvers around as a matter of course. And it's just, it feels like a nod to the reader in some respects and it's just like, Oh, I love it. <laughs> I also really enjoy her misdirection. And again, how she makes the characters wrong so many times. So it's like they've all kind of banded together and they're off in this direction and they're so certain. And then she cuts them down with a single sentence. So like on page 111, where we're really building up to something and then nope. Nope, I love seeing my characters fail. And to that end, I love how real the characters feel because up until like halfway through the book, they don't even truly believe what's happening. So page 135, literally halfway through the book, there's kind of these China figurines that represent each of the characters. So as they go down, the China figurines go down too or disappear, however you wanna think about it. And literally halfway through the book, they still don't believe. It's only their first inclination toward the China figurines where they're like truly starting to think, oh, maybe these are legitimately connected. <sighs> halfway through halfway through. That's most of my actual reactions. Just, oh shit. <laughs> oh, we're close to a boil. All right, turn the heat off, remove from heat, immediately pour in gelatin and stir. Was there anything else I was supposed to do? Stir in gelatin until it's all. Pour mixture through sieve into yogurt honey mixture and add the vanilla. Oh, 
I don't have a sieve, so we're just going with the pour. Mix until combined. And I also need to add in a little bit of vanilla. There's like a little bit of resistance. So it definitely is creamy. Next step is we're supposed to divide this mixture into ramekins, ramekins, but I don't have those, so I'm just gonna use some cups. Real professional here. And then you're supposed to chill for four hours until it's firm, then you're gonna drizzle honey over it, and then we go eat. But I gotta do the rest of this first. <laughs> the number of times these characters have meetings and then reconvene and then go totally off what they said and then come back, they don't trust each other, some they do trust and then they learn not to trust the other and I just, ooh, it feels very real. Agatha Christie also heightens this occasionally by changing up the cadence with which she writes and ooh, it's to such great effect. Hold on, let me find my book. Page 173 and 215. I'm talking lots of in dashes, a lot of ellipses, and then just like very quick alternating of thoughts between the characters. Even just the tonal changes, it really grabs her attention and it's perfectly timed and elevates the work. It elevates the part that you're reading. It's just, oh, so good. Doot, doot, doot. <laughs> Right here. One of us, one of us, one of us. Three words, five people. Just those paragraphs alone. And then this one, I'll try to hide the parts that are spoilers. But just this change goes eons past. World spun and whirled. Time was motionless, it stood still. It passed through a thousand ages. No, it was only a minute or so. Two people were standing looking down at a dead man. Oh, oh, this isn't how the rest of the story is written. So when you get to that part, you're just like, you are gripped. Let's see, how am I gonna do this? Okay, scoop it up. So let's go back to the time and place of this. The novel references the war a couple times and what she means is World War I, which was fascinating to me. Also, it's set in England, which I think I missed a couple, there were a couple bits of things that I just didn't understand and I think that did, if I'd known more about the area would have helped, but you guys know I love reading books that aren't set in the States, so this actually wasn't that big of a deal or anything. In a similar vein, but wrapping back into that more offensive part of the past, there's a couple stereotypes about a Jewish man and it, there really are only a couple, I mean like two, but it's just so jarring as a reader nowadays, like we would never see that. And also um, the term pagan is used synonymously to like a very negative effect with like heathen or degenerate, which we also definitely don't see it used that way. And very specifically in my writing lesson learn was about the use of the term queer. And this is definitely like, we have a totally different meaning today than we did back then. But what I find most interesting about it is that because we have such a different meaning, the word stood out every single time it was used and it was used a lot. Whee! Well. <laughs> Queer here means like strange, but again, word choice is so important as a writer so that it's to the point where like, where I'm a beta reader with people, if they use the same, word to describe something within like, you know, a couple paragraphs. I'm like, you should probably change that. Switch it up a little bit, make it more interesting for the reader as long as it flows. The term queer is used here so, so much. And I think when I tried to replace it with strange, it didn't stand out to me as much, but, but still the number of times it's used is shocking. Like I put an arrow. So this is page 22 and 23. 22, we've got it. Then right here on page 23. And then not four pages later, we have it again. And that amount of usage is used throughout the entire novel. It was a lot, it was a lot. And also, they also reference Black Brothers a couple of times and the way with which the characters react is set to the time and place, just so you're aware. But also talking about word choice, I learned several words and phrases that I had not known before. And I was kind of like giddy getting to look them up because it was like when I was a kid and I was going and looking through an actual old dictionary that we had at home and searching for the meaning of words. I don't know if everyone else does that with as much excitement as I do, but <laughs> I love me some new words. So what did I learn? Stolidly fly in the ointment, camgorm? 
Pangorm? That's a Rumgo and Bunkum. I think I've actually seen Bunkum used before, but I don't think I ever knew exactly the definition. <laughs> All right, now that everything's done, I guess I should put them in there first. Should I cover them? I'll cover them. That's one down. <laughs> it's like MTG Prince. Welcome to my fridge. Ultimately, I really, really enjoyed this book. I do plan on reading more Agatha Christie after this. And Then There Were None is her most sold book ever. And like I mentioned before, it's the best-selling mystery novel of all time. And it is the sixth best-selling novel of all time. Just period, novel, sixth best-selling ever. <sighs> And I get why it's really good. It's really fast paced. The characterization, other than the initial confusion, is really, really good. And honestly, I think if she'd done it any other way, it wouldn't have the impact. So, Agatha Christie. Ms. Agatha. Also, I guess I should say why Honey Panna Cotta? And it's because within the rhyme, six little soldier boys playing with a hive, a bumblebee stung one, and then there were five. Bumble, bee, honey, Panna cotta. <laughs> There's not much left in this one. Really, I just wanted to try this recipe out. <laughs> I'll let you know in four hours how it is. There's like a little bit left. I just funnel into mouth. Ooh, I'm so interested to see how this tastes once it's more like set, but it is good. I mean, honey, cream, where can you go wrong? Mmm, <laughs> that actually is really good. I'll probably finish off what's remaining in the bowl. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Next baking and booking or cooking with classics episode, I'm going to do either The Little Prince or The Count of Monte Cristo. I haven't decided yet, but I'm excited to read both. Please comment down below and let me know what you think of the mystery genre. Do you love reading mystery novels? Do you like getting scared like that? Do you like the suspense? Or do you just like to watch them in TV shows and movies? Do you like it more as a subset of a different genre to have kind of like a mystery throughout? Or do you hate mystery completely, like point blank, not for you? Down below, I'd absolutely love to hear about it. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see y'all very soon with a new video. Bye. The texture. <laughs> you know what Paul and Mary would say about that texture, right? A creme brulee without the caramel, caramel on, top. on top. So my answer to it is this, mine. <laughs> I started to do that. Mm. <laughs> that is, Just all the way around. <laughs> that, is really, that is really wonderful. Yay!